Hey everyone, so I'm Joy. Um, I'm a senior software engineer at WePay. Um, if you haven't heard about WePay, uh, we provide um, payment solutions for platform businesses through our API. Um, so for this talk, I'm going to be talking about database streaming. Um, we live in a world where we expect kind of everything to be streamed, right? Like our music is streamed, our TV shows are streamed. So I want to argue that the data in our data warehouses should not be considered as second class citizen. We should allow everything to be streamed in real time so that we can access these data um, as soon as they arrive into the database. So this talk is about our journey at WePay going from an ETL data pipeline into a streaming based um, real time pipeline. The talk is going to be broken down into three sections. We're first going to kind of go over what our current ETL pro or our previous ETL process looked like and what are some of the pain points that we were going through. We're also going to introduce change to capture, which is um, how um, the mechanism that we use to stream data from our database. Next, we're going to take a look at a real world example, which is how we're actually streaming data from MySQL into our data warehouse. And uh, finally, we're going to kind of go a little experimental and take a look at some of the ongoing work we're doing with streaming Cassandra into BigQuery, which is our data warehouse, as I mentioned. Um, let's get started. So at WePay, we use BigQuery. For those of you who um, are in the AWS S land, this is the equivalent of um, Redshift. So it's basically uh, the Google's uh, cloud um, data warehouse. It uses NC compliant SQL as its query language, which makes it really easy for our developers and engineers to pick up. It um, supports nested and uh, repeated data structures for things like lists and um, or structs and even geospatial data types, which is actually something very useful for CDC, as you will see later on. And um, it has um, a material, or sorry, a virtual view feature, which you can create views on top of the base tables. And because these views are not materialized, when you're querying the view, you're essentially querying the under underlying table. And this will allow you to access the data in real time, uh, sorry, access real time data even through views. And that's another feature that we're leveraging very heavily at WePay for our streaming pipeline, which we'll also go into later on. So at WePay, we use a microservice architecture. Um, most of our microservices are stateful, and the states are typically stored into a MySQL database. And we use Airflow as a tool to orchestrate our data pipelines. For anyone who hasn't heard about Airflow, you can kind of think of it as cron on steroids that's designed for data pipelines and complex workflow. And the way we're using Airflow is basically by periodically pulling the MySQL database for change. Um, the way we, we, det uh, we detect these changes by looking at the modify time column in each table. And if the modify time has, modif has been changed in the most recent interval, we upload that information into BigQuery. It's pretty standard. With this approach though, we are starting to hit a lot of limitations and um, operational overhead. So the first problem, which ties back to the talk from, uh, from the introduction, is that it has very low latency, or sorry, very high latency. The data won't actually arrive into BigQuery until much later. Some of our jobs, uh, we try to push the limit to once every 15 minutes, so the job runs in 15 minute interval. Um, but then we get into this inconsistency where an analyst may be trying to do a join in BigQuery, and one of the table is being uploaded on an hourly or daily basis, and another table is being uploaded every 15 minutes, and then the data becomes inconsistency. So it's like, why is it not in this other table, but it's here. The second problem is that because the way we use Airflow um, is that we're creating one job for every single table. In Airflow, a job is called a DAG, or Directed Acyclic Graph. Um, so we have basically hundreds of DAGs. Each of them is responsible for a table. And um, this is a whole lot of operational or configurations as well as overhead when it comes to monitoring. So it's not quite ideal. Another problem is hard deletes. We can't allow hard deletes in our database because when you're pulling the database, you're running these select queries, you're, it's not going to generate 
which data has been deleted is only going to show you what's in the database. So uh, we basically have to tell our microservice owners about, hey, just don't delete anything in these tables, which is pretty error prone. And that leads to the fourth point is that it is very error prone. We are relying on our um, microservice owners to be doing the right thing. Not only do they, must they not delete rows from this table, we, they must be able to guarantee that they're always updating the modified timestamp every time, because otherwise we'll still get into a data inconsistency issue because we won't be able to detect those changes. Finally, the schema management is actually manual, because if a DBA decides to go into the database and um, they want to say add a column to a, a table, Airflow doesn't know about it. So now we have to go into Airflow and we have to manage every single one of those tables or how, whichever table that uh, needs to be modified and we have to um, update the schema so that it propagates to BigQuery and so on. On top of all these problems, um, we're, our data ecosystem is constantly evolving. We're adding new tools that are optimized for different jobs. We may introduce a Redis that optimizes for key value cache. We may introduce um, Elasticsearch to do full text search. We may want to add a graph database for fraud detection. Or we may want to add some live dashboards and um, alert and monitoring system that help us understand how our business is doing right now. And Airflow being a batch oriented tool, it's not meant for streaming. So we needed a better tool for this job. And as Many of you probably already guessed it, or if you already read the summary in the talk, we use Kafka. Um, with Kafka now, every single downstream derived application can now just listen to the Kafka log and apply the changes um, at their own pace, which is really nice. And because Kafka is designed for streaming, this solves the streaming problem. The next question is, we know that we're going to be using Kafka. The question is, how are we getting the data from these databases into Kafka? There's a couple options. First one, we can just double write to both system, right? Every time we're updating the database, we make sure we're also sending a message to Kafka. Then the question is, should we do this synchronously or asynchronously? If we update <coughs> asynchronously, we'll again get into data inconsistent <coughs> issues because we don't know whether the data has been successfully written into Kafka when we're doing the updating to the database. If we do this synchronously, uh, which means that every time we successfully send to Kafka, we commit the change. Every time we fail to send to Kafka, we abort the change. But we're talking about distributed systems here, and errors are our friends. The problem is timeouts. <laughs> timeouts is um, something that we don't quite know whether the change, it could be a network glitch that essentially caused a timeout and the data could have been successfully running to Kafka or it could have not, so we wouldn't know what to do. And to solve that properly, um, that required distributed transaction, which means something like two-phase commit. Um, and two-phase commit is not trivial to implement and get right. It requires a set of interfaces, or sorry, a, yeah, a set of interfaces and tools to actually implement it, and the vanilla Kafka doesn't support it. And not to mention that with two-phase commit, it means it requires multiple round trip to do a consensus in order to have each write committed. And that's going to take a lot of time, and a lot of production database cannot allow that kind of latency. There's the second option. This is a cool kid on the club. It's event sourcing, right? Uh, which means we're using Kafka as a source of truth. Every time we write the, uh, we only write the data into Kafka, and we're going to treat the database just like any other derived system. The database is just going to be pulling changes from this Kafka log, and it's going to apply them into the database one by one. This looks much cleaner, and it will solve a lot of headaches. However, there is um, one problem with this for some use cases. And it's called, uh, it's read your, read your write consistency. Um, read your write consistency is the idea that when you're updating some data and you're trying to read from what you've just updated, you're expected to get what you just wrote. But with this setup, we're actually may potentially be reading stale data because say if we have a traffic spike and we have a bunch of data that are being sent into Kafka and then the database is slow at catching up. So at that point, if we're trying to do a read, we're going to be reading stale data. So um, that's really bad when you're building an application like an account balance where you need to guarantee that your users are not withdrawing money to go into negative balance. And that's, this is problematic for that. 
Then there is the third option, which is change data capture using the write ahead log. So change data capture is a design pattern in databases that basically says um, every single, uh, that basically captures every single database changes into a stream of change events. And then anyone that is interested in these change events can listen to the change and, the, and the react accordingly. And we mentioned we're going to do this with the write ahead log. So Red Hat log is pretty much implemented in every single database out there. Um, it's kind of an implementation detail of each database rather than an API. And the idea of the Red Hat log is that before we update the data into the storage file, we're first going to update them into the Red Hat log, um, just like the name sounds. And there are some benefits to this approach. Uh, the first is crash recovery. Now, if we've um, if the database crashes halfway while writing the data into the storage file, um, the database upon restart can look at the commit log, replay the change, restore the corrupted data, so that's great. The second benefit is inc improving write performance in certain scenario. This is a case where you have a single transaction, but you're updating a lot of, database, a lot of tables, and these tables probably reside on different storage files. So instead of trying to uh, update on each of those tables individually, it's first going to sequentially write all of those changes into this log. That's only a single F-sync versus F-syncing on each of those individual um, uh, storage log. So it's much faster. The third benefit is streaming replication. A lot of databases already apply this, like MySQL, where all the replicas are just looking at the commit log and, ta and telling the commit log, applying the change, and then um, updating these replicas asynchronously. One other detail that's worth mentioning about the write ahead log is um, specifically for MySQL is that it gives you two options. You can either log um, statement, you can either do statement-based logging or you can do role-based logging. Statement-based logging means you're logging the queries and role-based logging means you're actually logging the data after the change has been applied. And in terms of changing the capture, Role-based logging is very useful since now you, not, you have the data for the entire row, not just a column you've updated. So um, by using change to capture with the right head log, we get the best of all the worlds. We don't have to worry about implementing distributed transaction, but we get all of the transactional guarantees. And because we're asynchronously tailing this commit log, uh, or sorry, not commit log, this um, MySQ MySQL bin log or some kind of uh, write ahead log, um, we don't have to worry about impacting the performance when we're writing the data into the database because it's asynchronous. Now let's take a look at how exactly we're using CDC um, for at WePay to stream database from MySQL into BigQuery. So we use, um, under the hood, we use Kafka Connect framework, or we leverage Kafka Connect framework for this job. Um, the source connector is responsible for getting data from external sources and publishing them into Kafka. The sync connector is responsible for reading from Kafka and uh, storing them into external syncs. Uh, applied at WePay, our source, our source data is MySQL. Uh, our data sync is BigQuery. Our uh, source connector is the BZM, which is an open source project, and our data sync is KCBQ, which stands for Kafka Connect BigQuery. It's something we named ourselves because we wrote it. And we're going to break this up into two sections and talk about each part of them separately. So first, um, MySQL into Kafka. And we, I have to definitely talk about Debezium before going into any details. So Debezium is an open source project. Um, it's basically meant for CDC uh, on top, and it's built on top of um, a Kafka Connect framework. And the way it does this is by basically just, like CDC, reading the write ahead log and converting them into individual changes um, and record them on a row level basis. Uh, uh, Debezium guarantees at least one semantics, which is the same guarantee as Kafka. And um, this means we don't have to worry about we'd ever lose data, but we may potentially get duplicates. And finally, um, Debezium currently already supports MySQL, MongoDB, Postgres, Oracle, and SQL Server. So how does Debezium look like um, in action? Before we start a Debezium connector, we probably already have some database running in production. It's probably already replicating to some replica. 
So when we first start the connector, it's going to ask the database to give it the, the file name and the position of the most recent write, and it's going to record that information. Uh, next, it's going to run a select star from table, um, every single table from the database, and it's going to convert the result set into individual create event and publish these events into Kafka. And because some tables are huge, this could potentially take a couple hours. And during this time, um, the database may be, write, may be having additional writes and that may be replicating to the database, uh, to the replica, and MySQL, sorry, and Debezium is just going to temporarily ignore that. Once the snapshotting is complete, Debezium is going to start to catch up. And it's, it knows where to catch up because they recorded the file name and the position of the most recent write. And then once it's finally caught up, it will start streaming the data in real time, just like any other replica, except instead of storing the information, it's sending that information to Kafka. So let's take a look at what a Debezium event looks like. The before section is what the data looks like before the change. After section is what the data looks like after the change. The source section provides a bunch of metadata about the data source, so like the server ID and the file name and positions, as well as the database and the table that's coming from. And if you're familiar with MySQL, uh, since 5.6, it introduced GTID, so this is actually able to support GTID as well instead of using the file name and position. The op section represents the type of operation. U is for update, C is for create, and D is for delete. And the timestamp is the timestamp of when this event was created in Debezium. If it's a create event, before it would be null. If it's a delete event, after it would be null. So this um, original pipeline I've showed you at the very start, um, is pretty different from what we're actually running in production. It's a little bit more complicated than this. Um, let's take a look at why. So for, we're not going to basically directly reading from the MySQL in production, uh, sorry, the, production, the master of the MySQL uh, instance because we can potentially have snapshots that could take hours. We don't want to impact the performance. So we set up a MySQL replica, and we, this replica is dedicated for Debezium, and we're just going to be tailing from the, the replica. But having just one replica is not enough, because what if it goes down? So we set up a secondary replica, and this is responsible to, uh, in case the primary is down. In order to handle failover, we add a proxy in front of it, so that if the primary is down, we um, read from the secondary instead. But of course, we don't just have a single microservice. We have many microservices, and each one of them will be replicating to the same primary and secondary MySQL replica. And the reason that we're doing, we're using just a single cluster of primary and secondary replica for Debezium is for operational cost. We, um, we know that as we add more microservices, this could potentially become pro problematic, and we may potentially add additional cluster as well. But for now, um, this is sufficient for us, because we're a startup. Um, but even though we only have a single Debezium dedicated MySQL uh, rep, uh, cluster, we do have a individual Debezium connector for, that corresponds to every single one of those microservices. And this is important because it allows us to configure each microservice Debezium connector uh, based on um, what works for that particular connector. And it also allows us to bring up and down a specific connector um, in the case we're doing any kind of troubleshooting without affecting the rest of, well, the entire streaming pipeline, basically. And we run these connectors in distributed mode for fault tolerance. So this is what it actually looks like in production. Just a little bit more complicated. Um, now that we got our data into Kafka, the next question is, how are we getting the data from Kafka into BigQuery? As the reason we built KCBQ is because at the time there was no existing BigQuery, Kafka to BigQuery connector. We have open sourced it, so if you're interested, it's there on the WePay GitHub. Um, there's a couple nice features about this connector. First of all, it has a config configurable retry logic, which means that um, 
BigQuery will sometimes give you these retriable transient errors and the connector is intelligent enough to know about it and it's going to retry in order to not drop any messages. Um, but because sometimes this error could last for a while, we've implemented the retry logic with exponential backoff so that it won't have to hit the API too frequently in the case it's down for a long time. Um, secondly, um, this KCBQ is capable of lazily updating the schema uh, for the, our tables. What the lazily means here is that um, Debezium itself is actually going to cache the schema for every single table as for every single uh, table, and when the new message arrives, it's going to leverage the, the the data in that cache, and it's going to try to send the message to BigQuery with the version in the cache. Um, in the case where it gets the schema error back, it knows that the schema is outdated. It will then go fetch the latest schema from the schema registry, and it will retry again with that latest schema. So that helps us deal with automatic um, schema evolution. And finally, um, KCBQ supports both batch and streaming-based um, uploading. Or uh, It basically uses BigQuery's batch API and BigQuery's streaming insertion API. The benefit of the batch API is when you're doing snapshotting, it's a more faster option. And when the snapshotting is complete, you can then basically flip the switch to use the streaming-based API, um, which allow you to access data in real time. There is one additional information that we had to add to the KCBQ event, and that's the Kafka offset. I'll explain why in a second. But the Kafka offset, um, if you're not familiar with it, it's essentially the position of this offset of this record in Kafka. So here is what a table, an example table looks like when we're querying for all the field in this table. Um, and I've also included Kafka offset, offset there as well. Notice that this is actually not very useful. We're getting every single record, um, every single change event. What we really want is just the final change. So we leverage Kafka offsets to, to do deduplication and compression and determine what is we actually need to show to the user. The reason we can trust the Kafka offset is because the data are partitioned by primary key. So, and in Kafka, anything, in a partition is guaranteed to be ordered. So now we know that any data with a larger offset arrived at a later time. So with the Kafka offset, we can now dedupe our data by primary key, and uh, we now have a version that mirrors what's in BigQuery. An additional benefit of using BigQuery view is that we can actually mask any of column that we don't want to see. Um, because, for example, email is PI sensitive data, and we don't want certain uh, most of the user to see this information, we create another view on top of our um, the view I showed you guys earlier, and this view um, does not have the email information. And because BigQuery has access control uh, configuration, so we can give different user different permissions to different tables. There is one final piece in this pipeline that I briefly mentioned but didn't really get into, and that's the schema registry. So at WePay, we use the Confluence schema registry, and this is basically a registry that stores a version history of all of the data schemas. What's really cool about the Confluence schema registry is that it dog foods on Kafka. So what that means is that it uses Kafka as its underlying storage for all of the schemas, so you don't have to spin up a new storage engine or database of some sort to handle schema. And uh, schema registry supports um, Apache Avro as its a serialization format, which guarantees both forward and backward compatibility, which is always a good thing. And finally, we don't want our schema registry to, be, to become our single point of failure, because that defeats the whole purpose of a resilient pipeline. And the schema registry is designed to be both distributed and single master. It leverages Zookeeper, to, um, to do any kind of failover, but essentially it is resilient to failure. To put it all together, here is um, what schema evolution looks like. We have, um, oh, so before that, one thing worth mentioning is that in, the MySQL bin log doesn't just store the data change. It also stores every single schema change. This is really useful because now Debezium, upon receiving a schema change, it's going to 
cache this schema change, and it's going to update this information to schema registry. Any following information that, or any following data change event it receives, it can now use this new cached version of the schema instead. And um, so by the time the, the data gets into KCBQ, KCBQ doesn't know about the schema change yet, so it's just going to send the data with its older cached version. But BigQuery is going to give us an error saying the schema is wrong, and KCBQ can now fetch the latest schema from the schema registry and then send, this infer, uh, send the data to BigQuery using this new schema. So that completes this automatic schema evolution, which is really useful. Okay, so as I mentioned, this final part is going to be a little bit experimental as it's something we're currently working on, but it's interesting enough and relevant, re relevant enough to CDC, and I'm really excited to share it with you guys. So at WePay, um, as our company grew, we began to see a need for a NoSQL database that's optimized for high write throughput, for horizontal scalability, and for high availability. And Kafka became the obvious top contender. By introducing Kafka to our stack, though, we also need to figure out how we want to do CDC for Kafka. At first, we thought, we figured this out for MySQL. How hard could it be? It turns out that it's a little bit more complicated. And for because this talk is not a Cassandra-focused talk, it's going to be, um, I'm going to be skipping over a lot of details on Cassandra. I'm only going to talk about the Cassandra stuff that are directly related to CDC. So the thing that makes um, Cassandra really difficult for change data capture is its replication model. Unlike MySQL, which uses primary replica replication model, Cassandra uses a peer-to-peer -peer replication model. This means that all the nodes are equal. It also means that every single node is able to handle both reads and writes. And this also means that if we look at the data in a single node, it only contains a subset of the entire um, cluster of nodes, and which makes sense, right? Because that's how you do horizontal scala scalability. You don't want a node to contain all the data. Um, so uh, the next question is how exactly then does Cassandra determine where each data, uh, which node does each data go into? <coughs> so the way Cassandra handles this is that it divides the data into a cluster of nodes. Um, it's typically visualized as a ring, and uh, each of the node in this ring is responsible for a subset of all the data, and it's called the token range. So in this naive, naive example, we have a total possible token values from 0 to 19, and each node is responsible for a quarter of them. So when a request comes in, it's going to have a primary key or partition key value. The reason there is always going to be a partition key is because Cassandra tables, sorry, Cassandra schemas require you to specify a partition key for every single table. So in this case, the, part, the partition key is foo, and one of the nodes is going to be picked at the coordinator node. The job of the coordinator node is to hash this partition key, convert it into a token value. And depending on what this token value is, the coordinator is going to forward this information, this request, to the node that is responsible for writing this change. But what if this node C dies, then this is no longer fault tolerant. So the way Cassandra solves this is by increasing the replication factor. This example here has a replication factor of one. In reality, we, it typically has a replication factor of three. With the replication factor of three, the way Cassandra distributed this, this um, token range is by walking along this token ring and then basically replicate this range to its neighbors until the replication factor has reached. There are more sophisticated ways of distribution, but this is just a naive example. And with this approach now, um, this, uh, when the coordinator is forwarding the data, three of these four nodes are actually going to all store this data. So now we don't have to worry about uh, not be, being able to write when one of the nodes is down. How does this relate to CDC? Well, there is actually also a write-ahead log in every single one of these 
um, node in the cluster. And this is called a commit log in Cassandra. This commit log will only record the data, the writes that are specific to that node. And um, then the way we can actually um, handle CDC is that we can put one agent, a CDC agent, in each of these nodes. And this agent is going to be responsible for um, reading the data from this commit log and sending them off into Kafka. In fact, since Cassandra 3.0, they actually introduced a feature, a CDC feature. And this feature provides us with a file reader and the file read handler. And the handler is already deserialized this information from the commit log. So we thought all we have to do then is to take this mutation, which would, is what they call a change of event, extract the data that we care about, convert it into Avro, um, package it, and then send it off to Kafka. But as you're probably already thinking, there are a couple problems with this approach. Um, first of all, um, we get duplicated change of event. Because we have a replication factor of three, when we're reading from all these logs, we're going to get three copies of all the data. So somewhere down in our pipeline, we need to figure out how to do the deduplication. Second problem is out of order events. This one is a little bit more subtle. Um, because we're dealing with this distributed system here, it is possible that when two different clients are writing to the same row at the same time, but to do two different values, in this case, maybe one client is changing the first name to Anne and the other client is changing the first name to Alice. And node one and node two receive Alice first and then Anne, while node three receives Anne first and then Alice. Now these three different nodes actually have a different understanding of what's the most recent data. The way Cassandra cleverly handles this is using the concept of last right wing. So when a client is uh, sending a request, it actually generates a client side timestamp. And this timestamp gets propagated into every single column of, these, um, of this row of the data. So this way, when the client is reading the data from these nodes, if it sees the discrepancy between two or more nodes, it's going to always pick the latest um, the row with the latest timestamp. But because our CDC pipeline is outside of the read path of Cassandra, we have to basically figure out how to do this ourselves. Third problem <laughs> is incomplete change of event. Cassandra is optimized for write, so unlike MySQL, where it's going to do a read before every single write, Cassandra is just going to blindly write the data into the database. And because of this, we're only going to know the columns that have changed. We're not going to know um, all the rest of the rows of that, rest of the columns of that row. And because of this, our our mutate, or sorry, not mutation, our change of events is incomplete, and we need to somehow figure out how to piece together this information in our pipeline. And a fourth problem is unlocked schema change. So Cassandra um, does have, you, you, you can modify your schema in Cassandra. However, it uses a completely different read-write path from a data change event. It uses gossip protocol to handle or propagate a schema change. This means that this data is never going to be recorded into the commit log. So if we're only listening to the commit log, we're not going to, be, to know about any schema change. Our current solution that um, we're working on, we call it the bridging the gap solution, is that we're going to ignore all the problems, at least <laughs> at least until the data get into BigQuery. So basically, the agent's just going to parse all of these data, send it off to Kafka. Kafka is going to send all of these data into BigQuery. Everything in BigQuery is um, unordered, it's duplicated, and it's incomplete. But then we're going to heavily leverage BigQuery view to, view to handle all of this. In order for BigQuery to know how to do this, it needs a little bit more information. It's not only going to store the value of every of every single column. It's also going to re record the timestamp, which is when the data is updated. It's going to record a deletion timestamp in the case the data is uh, deleted. And it's also going to create a Boolean field, or record a Boolean field, which is the is primary Boolean. That just represents whether this column is a primary field or not. So let's take a look at the data now that we have stored them into BigQuery. This Corey specifically looks at the first name column. And um, 
if we want to also query for the last name column, we are getting, uh, notice that the second row is null, and that's because the second event is just an update, so we only updated first name. This is not quite useful because what we actually want is a second event for first name, but the, uh, but the first event for last name. So the way we can handle this is basically by looking at the timestamp field, compare them and find the one with the latest timestamp. And then we can return the user or ret create a view that returns the user with the data that's been deduplicated, it's been ordered, and um, it's complete. And in order to do this, we have to heavily leverage BigQuery, uh, including its UDFs as well um, as um, a lot of like like, what I'm thinking, um, group I and so on. There are some advantages to this approach. The first advantage is quick iteration. Because we basically didn't change anything in our pipeline and we're doing all the heavy lifting in BigQuery, and BigQuery view is very cheap to create, to modify, to delete. So then we can, as we experiment with Cassandra, we can basically um, modify the view as necessary. The second benefit is that there's very few operational overhead. Notice, aside from the Cassandra CDC agent, we didn't introduce anything new. So this way, as we're solving this problem, we don't want to be thinking about the, the uptime of other services or other uh, application that help out through this, for this pipeline. And um, finally, because we're leveraging off the base table in BigQuery, we're not going to impact Cassandra production because we don't have to basically, on every write, uh, read back into Cassandra to get the full row because all of our data are already in BigQuery. But of course, it comes at a cost. The, most, the, biggest, uh, the first cost is it's very expensive because this means every time a user is querying for this view, we have to do all of this piecing the data together, um, and it's, it's going to get very expensive. On top of this, we're recording a replication factor of three, which means that it's going to amplify and the table is going to get really big, really fast. So we'd have to do some maintenance work in order to minimize this view. And the way to do compaction is by just materializing this view periodically. But it is going to be an op another overhead. And finally, notice we've only solved this problem for BigQuery, which means that if any other downstream derived system is trying to read from this data, they're out of luck. They basically have to re-implement all of this themselves, and that's not quite ideal. So for sake of completion, I've included a f potential future solution um, that's, that we're considering. It's a little bit more complicated because now it introduces a stream processing engine, introduces a cache, a database, and a second Kafka. So let's go through how this would work. Um, the message are still going to arrive into Kafka, duplicated and out of order. The first thing the stream processing engine is going to do is by checking against the cache to see whether this data has been processed or not. If it hasn't been processed, then we will process this, otherwise we can drop the message. Next, the stream processing engine is going to check against the database. It's going to notice um, whether the timestamp, or it's going to compare whether the timestamp of what's in the database against the timestamp of this event. And in the case where we have an older timestamp in our event, we can drop it as well. And finally, because we've done a read on this database, we now get both the before and the after of every single event. So we can send this complete information into our second Kafka. Now when Kafka can, can then send this information into KCBQ, which then can propagate into BigQuery. And the benefit here is that if we have any other derived system that are reading from uh, Kafka, they now have a much nicer um, outcome. So, um, in summary, uh, there's three things I'm trying to, I guess, get through uh, to, for this talk. The first thing is that database as a stream of change event is a really natural and useful concept. It would make a lot of sense for every single database out there to be um, able to provide a CDC interface for the data to um, to be sent into other derived systems because otherwise we're talking about a very closed system where the database expects that this is going to be the final destination and the data is not going to go anywhere else and that's kind of selfish. 
the second, <laughs> the second point is that log-centric architecture is at the heart of streaming data pipelines. It helps us solve a lot of the problems when it comes to distributed transactions. Um, uh, and, it's, and it's very simple to implement and understand. And finally, CDC for peer-to-peer -peer databases is not trivial, as you probably already noticed. However, we're hoping as the tools gets better and as our understanding of these databases gets better, um, it will become easier over time. Some additional information, if you're interested in our MySQL to uh, BigQuery pipeline, there is a blog post uh, on our website that basically um, explains it in a little bit more details. I've also included the KCBQ GitHub link in case you're interested in using that. And uh, finally, the last piece is actually a blog post that my colleague has wrote this morning. It talks about um, schema evolution in the, in the, in the case where it breaks backwards compatibility. Because arrows, uh, you can, we can use arrows forward and backward compatibility to deal with schemas that do, um, that are compatible. But what happens if you have, um, you have data that are not, if you made a change that is not compatible in the database. So the last point kind of uh, talks, goes a little bit more into that. And I think it's super interesting and relevant for CDC. Um, and that's the end of my talk. Thank you guys. Okay, uh, thank you very much. This is an awesome talk. Um, I have a question. Can I start with a question? Sure. Um, so uh, for the future work, mm -hmm. the, you have a database sitting on the side. Uh, I have two questions. One mm -hmm. is, uh, so you could hydrate by just reading directly from one of the source databases. To yes, right? so, so the reason we don't want to uh, read directly from the source is because we don't want to impact the production of the source database. It is possible to create a second cluster, a Cassandra cluster, that is made specifically for um, the CDC purpose, but which is kind of what this could potentially be as well. So, But you have to keep it in sync with the sources. That's right. the challenge, right? Oh, so it's okay if it's asynchronous because we are, uh, for every single table, it's essentially serialized. Right. So then we know that it's going to be in order. Got so. it. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, who, who, any other questions? Uh, what do you think about writing the event from the application itself? Because we've implemented uh, the future solution that mm -hmm. you showed here. Yeah. Um, using events in the application write to Cassandra, write to Kafka, mm -hmm. and then we emit two events before and after into Kafka, and then we use the uh, stream processing engine with windowing to handle out of orderness, mm -hmm. and then distribute the updates to multiple databases. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, so the, one of the problems that we're seeing is like, well, there is the distributed transaction problem, so if you guys have potentially solved that, um, then that's great, but the, the, pro the other problem is that we do want to be able to um, get the before and after, uh, at least in the MySQL case, if we were to use um, if we were to use this event sourcing approach, then we only get the columns that have changed. So that was something we're trying to avoid. But in this case with Cassandra, it's simply not possible because the database itself doesn't do read before write. So um, that's also why we're kind of, this is kind of an event sourcing approach. Oh, okay, so now I kind of understand what you're saying. So you're talking about why not just to update Kafka first and then, um, and then basically being from. Mm -hmm. That approach works with Cassandra. You don't, have, you don't have to worry about multiple copies and stuff. So, mm -hmm. so you, uh, can you go into detail? You, you read from Cassandra, send it to Kafka. You write to Cassandra and then write to Kafka, so you get the before and after. Uh, before you write to Cassandra, you write an okay. event to Kafka, and then once it's successful, you write another event to Kafka. So that, that's a distributed transaction problem. Mm -hmm. It's kind of, but it yeah. kind of gets around it. Yeah. And another thing is, if, if you are using Cassandra for um, for any kind of like transactional things where you care about read your own write consistency, that could potentially become a problem, I think, where you need to guarantee that every time you're reading from the database, it's, as, it's the latest thing. It's some, it has what you've written already. What's but the... Sorry. Okay. Yeah, we can take oh, it okay. offline after. Thanks. What's the motivation for going to Cassandra, given that it sounds like this is quite an effort to go to it? Is BigQuery not sufficient? 
or what's the limitation there? So uh, we want to use Cassandra more in the sense of a production database, BigQuery is, uh, sorry, in the sense of like, um, yeah, like OLTP database, whereas uh, BigQuery is more so for uh, analytical database, OLAP. So um, we want to optimize for write, and Cassandra is our best contender for that. So I had a quick question about the caching. Uh, that essentially materializes the view of the row within the cache, right? So how long yeah. do you know, how do you know how long to keep that cache before yeah, you throw so, it out? Yeah, so the cache is kind of going to be like an optimization, but it's not going to be like a source of truth because it is possible, say you set your TTL to 30 minutes, but for whatever reason, some one of the nodes is down uh, for a long, longer amount of time, then you can get the data later. But the database can then catch those problems by the time the data get there. So, Thanks. Thank you. Hi, uh, just a quick question. Could you not, uh, so I was just listening through the future solution for Cassandra where mm -hmm. you will get three copies of the data and out of order as well at times. Mm -hmm. Could you not just use one of the replicas as master and you could use Zookeeper for keeping that state and just have that one yeah. replica push it out? So that's actually something we considered where we would actually coordinate the yeah. different uh, agents so that only one of them is sending the message. The problem is that Cassandra is meant to be a peer-to-peer -peer database and it's meant where all the nodes should be equal. If we're started to introduce uh, Zookeeper into the picture, it's a little bit against Cassandra's philosophy, which is that um, any node can be taken up or down because now we're basically setting one of the nodes to be the master. And um, it's not definitely possible, but the reason we're not considering is because we kind of want to follow what Cassandra is known for, which is uh, this whole like, um, peer to peer, everyone is equal. Do you do write three, write equals three on all writes? Uh, right now we do, yeah. You raise your Just curious, thanks for the great talk. Just yeah. curious if you think there'll be anyone, people to build downstream applications off some of these streams or if it all goes to analytics. I've seen some interesting use cases of yeah. using this to actually generate other applications. Yeah, I think uh, um, it's definitely possible, which is why we want to have this future solution that allows other systems to be able to read from Kafka. If the only thing we care about was analytics, then our existing pipeline could kind of work for a while. So yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. uh, any others? Uh, sure. Um, I'm curious if you ever end up missing events due to like a network failure talking to Kafka or something like that, and if so, how do you deal with that? Um, so that's a good question. A lot of things that we're dealing right now are all in POC, so we haven't had like the the spend a lot of time and effort in terms of guaranteeing that our messages mm -hmm. are not lost and whatnot. I think it's potentially possible, um, as I've heard about similar scenario in other pipelines before with Kafka. So. Mm -hmm. um, but it will probably get a clear answer as we experiment more with this pipeline. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, if, are there any others? OK. Yeah, so my question is, um, you're paying off a lot of the uh, data duplication with a view on BigQuery. Mm -hmm. um, how, how much of a performance penalty are you incurring by like lazily evaluating the data this way? Um, it's, it's, so that's something that's just going to get worse over time. Uh, we are currently in the process of building this, so I don't have a good, whole good, lot of numbers for you, but it is definitely pretty expensive. BigQuery is great because it's able to do ex, uh, parallel execution, um, but even with that, we are, it is the concern that we, put, we could potentially take way too long for a single query to to do, which is why we're hoping compaction could help us uh, down the road, but yeah. Hey, thank you. Sorry, I can't, like, I don't have a good number is that, for is that. Is there a business trade-off, you think, like whether or not to throw away the outdated? Uh, it's the, the business trade-off is expense, right? It's going, the query cost is based off execution, so this is going to get expensive. <laughs> yeah. Thank you.
So I, I one uh, question is, if, if you do, and this might also be for Monol, but like okay. if you uh, cache and use the windowing and stream processor, you could probably dedupe there, at least for time window data. So, uh, right, yeah. Cassandra okay. itself actually has a TTL feature. So if we actually want to use Cassandra as this intermediary database, it's possible as well. Mm -hmm. This is in more in line with someone who had asked the question before. Mm -hmm. If data consistency is such a big requirement around here, what is the rationale for using an eventual thing like Cassandra? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. I think like we are because we're building a data pipeline, we want to optimize for different use cases. So maybe for one user, their goal is to use uh, to use Cassandra for write only, and another might be using Cassandra for uh, something that's a little bit more consistent. We are we're trying to make a more generic solution essentially that covers all these cases. But um, it's it's true though. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you are. In, your, in this mm -hmm. picture, you are envisioning uh, heterogeneous sources like Cassandra and other MySQL and things like that? Is oh, that no. Th so this pipeline is specifically for Cassandra only. OK. Mm -hmm. uh, great questions. Um, <laughs> maybe one more, if anyone has one. Everyone must be hungry. <laughs> uh, OK, great. Thank you very much. Thank you.